All right, let's look at the plan first. We are going to cover uh, some of the course projects today for about 30 minutes and then give you 25 minutes for the quiz. Still regarding stick diagrams, but nothing else. Doesn't like last time you have another problem, but only stick diagrams. If you have practiced with uh, problems in here or in here, you know, you should be fine. Um, I can see that I also have posted the solution for homework three. Also, I did a review just on Monday for homework three and a quiz four. So the solutions are posted as well. Uh, we are going to have another lecture on Friday uh, to wrap up the models for digital design. So all the parasitic capacitors for digital circuits and the models we are going to use for this for this class and clock the circuits on Monday. So after Monday's class, you should be able to start working with homework five, hopefully. And uh, there will be a quick, probably not, I don't know, since we haven't covered that much for, we will get enough probably on Friday. So prepare for another quiz for, is this due Friday? Wait, this is, oh yeah, so now, so the quiz, Whatever being covered on the quiz will not be digital models, but C5 layers. So I, so this is wrong. This is not correct. You know what I mean? Because the homework assignments over here is due, is due uh, the week after next next week. So you will not be ready for the quiz for digital design models. So this quiz on Monday next week will be C5 layers. I'm going to give you a top view of the layout, and I'm going to ask you to draw the cross-sectional view of the metals and polys, all these kind of things. You'll be ready for that if you turn in homework for tomorrow, right? Uh, no, on um, Friday. You should be ready for that on Monday. Okay. So you will have the quiz on Monday for C5 layers, cross-sectional view. And Wednesday, that's part of the spring break because you know the college is split all the spring breaks. They don't want you guys to travel far away from, from town to bring COVID back. Anyway, um, so Wednesday is a day off. And Friday, there's no in-person lecture. I'm going to either post a video for instructions for the course project or I'll just give you more time because you can see on the schedule, if you do not follow the schedule, I don't think you can finish everything for the project. So I will probably take some of the classes off to give you the time to work on the project, but I don't know which one I'm gonna take from these classes. There will be some, depends on your progress, um, because I still wanna cover, uh, have enough lectures to uh, cover memory, cir memory circuits, which are uh, pretty practical, and other special purpose ICs for this semester. So you can see that we, what I'm thinking is it's reasonable for you guys to finish the TI DFF by the 5th, which is Monday next week. It's already Wednesday, right? So see if you can get it done. You do not have to turn it in, but I think Follow this schedule will guarantee that you can you can finish the project. Just do not wait until the very last minute to start working on it. Remember the TIT DFF, this one? So you are able to set and reset. But this is not the only topology to design a D flip flop. You can do it using transmission gates, which takes even less space. Uh, so all these circuits are being built, are supposed to be built in LT spies. You are not going to lay it out. Keep in mind, since so we do not, we don't have, definitely do not have the time and the infrastructure to let you guys lay out a 50 nanometer star star ADC. It takes a year for these college graduate students in Columbia University to get it done. So we only use 
a educational purpose uh, model from the textbook. For all of you guys who are not here on Monday, so I'm going to show you this again really quick. So Dr. Baker's textbook has two models, which are not fabricatable, but you can use them for, for simulations. For example, you can use a one micron technology to simulate and to get a structure uh, which works for the one micron technology and also it may work for the 500 nanometer technology as well because when you are using the c5 you normally you double or triple the, the size for the width and the length remember so it's already about one micron per uh animals or pmos so if you simulate use a one micron if because even for c5 so first, I don't know where that C5 uh, models.txt file, where that came from. I don't know, because even though it's a 40-year 40, 40 tech, oh, old technology, it is still, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't disclose it. I think it's, it is something like, it's a simplified version or something made, made available for students. I don't know. If you uh, made a contract with uh, Moses, if you want to fabricate the C5 uh, wafer or die, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, NDA, right? To in order to get that C5 technology, even though it's already everywhere, it's already 40 years old, but still you have to sign the NDA. Um, so it's normally it's not available for the public. That's why you can see from my YouTube channel, I'm not, I was not planning on making profit from that, but you know, for these videos, I just randomly posted on my YouTube channel for all the lectures for the LT Spice C5 simulations. It's getting like 7,000 views. And people keep asking my questions. And I I'm really can because there are not thousands of questions. There are only probably 10 questions. I'm always reply to these questions. So people from, from India, from everywhere, every co corner on this planet are just when they watch the video, they ask questions because they, they do not have access to these C5 models. If they do not know Dr. Baker's website, right? Since I graduated from there, I know there's a C5 model, TXC file available on the website. So I downloaded it. I have been working on that for a while. Um, so not too many people know that because it's not, it's, you are not supposed to uh, disclose it. Uh, but we do have a simplified version. Um, so for the smaller channels, it's a lot different compared to long channels. If you look at the back, it's being appended to the back of the textbook. So there are two, uh, two models you can use. They are not fabricatable, but you can use them to design your circuits. One is a long channel. Technology is one micron. It's been simplified because you, can only, have, you only have these parameters in the model file and you are supposed to have a lot more than that you know so that's why it's just enough for lt spy simulation and for the short channel technology which is a 50 nanometer technology you cannot you, you'll never see this from anywhere else because it's not existing in the in the industry but it can still use it for simulations you know we are not so all the technology files are not accessible to the public but for students, what can we do? We still want to get some experience for circuit design. I mean, how, how can, I mean, whenever you are looking at the, um, a job opportunity posted on the website, they are requiring five years of experience on IT design. Because I've never used that. It's not available for the public. So the IT design industry has a really high bar. It's probably the highest in the STEM field. Not too many people can get experience from doing these uh, experiments. So there are not too many people, uh, not too many competitors available um, on the job market. So if you know how to do it, then it's not really hard to get a job. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can never design anything, right? Because we still have this, this 50 nanometer technology available. Uh, it, it allows us to simulate at least right simulating lt spies for some of the short channel designs it's not 20 nanometer it's not 10 nanometer not like that but at least if you want to fabricate a 
65 nanometer technology, uh, 65 nanometer chip with TSMC, for example. And you do not have that for now. I still want to design something and try it. I think this is a good option because 50 nanometer is really close to 65 nanometer, which is available from TSMC. You can still do the design using this um, model file. And compared to the 65 nanometer technology from TSMC, um, this is also one volt. The VDD is one volt. So just follow the design and um, scale these transistors properly. If that one works the LT spice, probably you can transfer everything to the 65 nanometer with TSMC when you are designing everything cadence. Right? This is how you make it work. Otherwise, you don't have even have a have a point to start with. You have nothing. This is free. LT spice is free. So let's just get started. And so look at the website for the uh, Columbia design for the SAR IDC. You'll find out it is a one volt power supply. So the reel to reel voltage, top reel, bottom reel, just one volt. Okay. It's the same as the 50 nanometer technology, so we can use it. So let's just do it. And so what are in there in the SAR IDC? Let's go to the IC design tag. Start with the sample and hold circuit. What is this one? And you need a you need to understand what is the charge pump, which is here. And why you have an almost here, why you have an almost here, why you have a cap here. So a lot of things covered by this circuit. So I when I was looking at this circuit, since this is my first time um, to 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 try to design a, a sample and whole circuit, but I do know a charge pumps and uh, bootstrapped circuits. So I'm looking at the description over here. So this guy ref referred to a reference. So when you read it, you can see it's a bootstrapped switch circuit described in reference one. So then I went down, scroll down, and to see reference one is not even here, right? Production, see if you can see that reference, still not here. Anyway, I think I saw that, oh, references. Okay. Razavi, remember I told you guys uh, from UCL, uh, UCLA? Um, whose textbook, he has a couple of textbooks uh, regarding analog IC design, are all considered as Bibles in <clears throat> integrated circuit design. So right now I'm just telling you how to do research, right? So all, all these steps, how I dig into all these articles. So I found out this reference and I uh, downloaded it from the website <clears throat> from Google, and I found out it's not really helpful because it covers a lot of things are not uh, really mentioned are not um, the details are not covered in the article just two pages and then so I start searching for sample and hold circuits and I find out there is a person was was a person in back in 1990 1990 or 1999 I forgot he designed this circuit so this these students didn't didn't reference this this circuit really well because it's not the origin of the circuit. So I eventually I find out the origin who invented this circuit. <clears throat> not Razavi's. Okay, Razavi just uh, did a um, pretty good uh, tutorial on bootstrapped circuit switches, which is only this part. So if you <laughs> look at Razavi's article, you can only understand what's going on for this part. And it's not really obviously you know, presented uh, here, it, it's hard to figure out this is a bootstrap to circuit switch. You know, it's it's not really good reference. So I eventually found out this gold article. Nineteen ninety nine. Okay. So the guy's name is Abel. 
Hubble. And I find another person, Paul Gray. So there are a couple of people in the IC design field are writing Bibles. Razavi is one of them. Gray is another one of them. Really famous guy. I think he's from Berkeley or somewhere else. I forgot. Um, so this is the ADC design, but I didn't read the uh, other parts of the paper. I do find the sample and hole circuit in the entire ADC design, and which explains all the details about this sample and hole circuit, how this works. So I'm going to introduce the uh, principle of charge pump really quick to you guys, and then I'm going to come back to the circuit to let you know how this works. And I have built this circuit in Alice Spice using a 15 nanometer technology uh, from Dr. Baker's book, and it works. So I will not directly just give the circuit to you guys. I'm going to show you how, how I simulate it from here. So it's been recorded. You can pause the video and try to duplicate it if you cannot make it work by, uh, on your side, right? But I will not just directly give you the circuit because you are, you are not going to think about how to design it. So this is done. So this sample and whole circuit is done, actually. And then the signal is being fed into this pin, right? And then it's going to sample and hold, which means it's going to discretize. Is that the correct way to say it? Discretize? Or discrete rise? Discretize, probably. So just make it convert the continuous sig analog signal into a discrete signal, not digital yet, because you don't have a DC yet. It's just sample and hold. Sample and hold it. Instead of a continuous, very smooth analog signal, it becomes a, you know, and, uh, there, there will be hundreds or tens of steps trying to follow that or track, try to, try to track that continuous analog signal. After that, you need a DAC. Do you need a DAC? No, it's not a DAC yet. Sample and hold, and then you need a comparator, right? Remember? Let's come back to introduction. Sample and hold, or track and hold, right? So that's a track and hold circuit, which is the one I just showed you. That's this block. Analog signal in and check and hold or sample and hold. So signals are being sampled. And then get into a comparator. Why do we need to get a signal sampled and hold and being held as a discrete signal instead of a continuous signal? So the signal will be held at that level, even though it's super short period of time but still being held as a constant during that cycle. And it takes time to do all these kind of computate calculations. So we don't want this signal to be changed as a continuous analog signal. So we want to hold it at some point. But when you are done, you want to release it. So it's going to sample another point. Right? So want this, you don't want this one to be analog. You want this to be a discrete signal. And then comparator. Comparator is nothing but a, a, a one op-amp, right? So you want to design an op-amp and um, do not give any feedback. There's a comparator. If you give a feedback, what is that? Is a signal get into a non-inverting terminal? If you have a feedback, so where do you want to feed, feed the signal back to where? Still remember this? to the inverting terminal, so it's the negative feedback. Okay? So you, you need a negative feedback for op amps, for amplifiers. And if you have a feedback, then it becomes a amplifier, operational amplifier instead of a comparator, because it's closed loop. Okay? It's fine if you don't know what I'm saying, but, you know, take analog. So understand all these things. Um, so where can we design the op-amp? I mean, the op-amp we designed was based on C5 in analog. 
so you cannot directly use it. And we are not going to lay it out. We just want to simulate it so the 50 nanometer model will be fine. And we just, so it's a one volt real to real voltage. And so the voltage has to be dropped appropriately in order to bias every stage at the proper voltage. So all the, uh, all the MOSs and PMOSs are on. You just don't know what I'm saying, but which is fine. <laughs> Since I have an example for you guys, just directly use it. Okay. It takes four weeks in analog to to learn these op amps. So if you are you are not in my analog class, it's difficult to understand what I'm what I'm saying. Just directly use it. Let me find a way. Hold pad. Okay. Figure 24.61, It has two stages, which can boost the gain. So these are the two inputs of of the op amp, inverting, non-inverting. If you make a symbol out of it, so you know, you can export this to inverting terminal. This is non-inverting. Just design the triangle shape, right? The symbol. Put everything in the, into the into the symbol. Inverting, non-inverting, and here is a differential output, and it's being amplified again by this differential pair. Okay, and then. The amplified signal is coming out from here, and this is a final stage buffer. You can see all the sizes of the PMOS and NMOS are huge because a super wide channel can source currents from the VD. So it has a huge channel. Whenever it needs to drive a larger load, it is able to source current from the VD. Just pull, just pull current from VD. So this is a final buffer. It's not amplifying anything, just a buffer. Um, actually, it has a pretty high gain, actually, um, because the current is high. So the trade-off is if you make this too large, then it takes a lot of space. If it's too small, you don't have enough gain, right? You just want to design this properly. And uh, fortunately, we don't have to design this in this project. We just directly use this circuit. And I'm going to provide the schematic of this op amp too, guys. You can see that um, the parameters are being used are the uh, table 9.2, so which means the 9.2 is the 50 nanometer parameters as a model's table. Let me show really quick. So that's 9.1, 9.1, and which is a long channel design, five volts. So you wanna see 9.2 instead of 9.1. So here's 9.2, page 300, and it's a one volt. So all these parameters are here. And it's the same table as the table I showed you, which is appended to the, to the textbook. And look at that table as well. So these are all these parameters for this for these models. Um, so directly use it. And also, you can see there's a signal from uh, external circuit, it's called V bias N. And yeah, that's the only one. So this signal is, is a bias signal to open up these NMOSs, to bias these NMOSs at a cer certain level. And you do need a circuit to provide that DC voltage. So that circuit is called beta multiplier, which we haven't covered. We didn't cover in analog because this is an advanced analog class to cover that part. We don't have time to do that. So the bias circuit is in tw figure 20.22.
20.22, which is here, <laughs> that's a headache. Try to use it because everything has been uh, enclosed in a uh, in the symbol, which I posted on the website. So you can directly download it, and simulate it. You don't have to design anything about the comparator, right? It just takes a lot of time to do it. You don't trust me? Let's take a look at it. Do you have five minutes? It only takes five minutes to get the comparator simulated. Comparators. Let's see where is that? Um, comparator. See, So this symbol is the bias, the biasing circuit, the beta multiplier. It's been directly used since this is a symbol already created by Dr. Baker. So it's been directly being used for the comparator circuit. It's just a black box, which is this guy. So this guy provides a biasing circuit for these NMOSIS. You can see these transistors are P underscore 15, 15 N, 50 nanometer. Okay, keep in mind, do not use one micron anymore. So how to simulate this guy as a com comparator? So BP is a voltage being fed into the non-inverting terminal. And you can see it's a AC signal. All right, so this is still the original circuit, and we want to simulate this guy in a different way. We just want to see if this guy will uh, saturate the output whenever it's oscillating, right? So how can we do that? So we do not have a... AC1 means the sine wave with uh, one volt offset or amplitude, actually. So this is offset, this is amplitude. I don't know why it's AC1. It shouldn't be AC1, actually. It should be AC. Shouldn't be any AC. It should be DC. So I'm giving, because the overall VDD is one volt, <clears throat> what is VDD? So I set up the reference voltage to be 500 millivolts. Okay. So what's going to happen is the reference voltage is in the middle. And here's VDD. So that's VP, right? And I'm going to design a, I'm going to feed a uh, sine wave to swing around that VP like this. So what's a comparator's output looks like? So this is VM. This is VM. So whenever VP, so see here, VP is here, and VM is larger than it, and VM is being fed into the non, uh, the inverting terminal. So in this case, you are expecting zeros, right? So for this period, because VM is larger than VP, and the open looking of the, this op amp is huge. So it's going to amplify that difference between VM and VP who are super negative voltage. But however, you want to have ground as the lowest potential. So it's going to saturate at zero. So you're expecting this. 
And for this one, BP is larger than VM, and it's going to saturate the output to VD. So here is what you are expecting. If you are getting this for the simulation, you know the comparator is working. It's digitizing the output. So let's see. <clears throat> VM is a sound wave. VP is a reference voltage. A quick, a quick, quick question here. So for the first 0.5 milliseconds, what is VL? Zero. Making sense? Is that working? Do you want to use it? Yeah, let's just use it. That's a good resource. <clears throat> okay, where we are, comparator done. Sample and hold. I have done it, so I'm going to show you the simulation really quick. Let's do it. Sample and hold here. Mm. So that's a data signal. You can see I name it as V data, right? And the VG is one volt. So I'm expecting V out to be a discrete, discretized uh, output signal. So let's run it and see. <clears throat> so let's see the look at the input first. Okay, so here's a signal. Really nice. And you can increase the Sample uh, the sampling rate, which is a clock. I think it is here. If you increase the sampling rate, let's make it to 10 and 20. Run again, and you are getting a better resolution. A lot better resolution. Okay, so all these AD convert conversions should be done within that period. So it should have a have all these signal, all these feedback and everything here to be done within that step. Okay. So you want to design your clock carefully. <clears throat> DAC, you have done it. You even laid it out using the resistor screens, right? The R2R. So this guy didn't use R2R, but I think you can use R2R. It consumes a little bit more power compared to the capacitor switches. And then SAR logic. And you, I think you have drawn the diagram on papers, but you haven't designed it in Altispice or uh, Electric VSI. This probably will be the most difficult part for this design, I think, because this is given this is given this is simple, and this will takes this will take the most time, most amount of time uh, for this design. So if we look at the schedule here, see if I give you enough time on that. Yeah, so I give you a week to work on that. So I won't assign like homework assignments during that week, hopefully. Um, it's just a little bit uh, laborious. It shouldn't be that difficult because if you have one uh, deep flip flop designed and ready, the block is ready in the library, you can directly just drag and drop into the 
schematic and simulated. I hope. Mm -hmm. mm. Control circuits. This is something we haven't covered yet. So if you look at this is their DAC. We're not going to use this DAC. We're going to use the R2R DAC. SAR logic has been covered. This is set and reset logic. Um, there might be, it, it's probably just creating some kind of delays to set and reset at a different cycle. Uh, I don't know, I haven't looked into this yet, but it's because this is simple. I just haven't started work, working on that. So here's the ISR, here's the SAR uh, register circuit. And you may, so here's a comparator. We're not going to use this comparator since we don't know if that works or not. I have to redesign it. It's directly used Dr. Baker's, the one I just provided. And timing logic, um, <laughs> which is not difficult because this is just a, uh, because you need a different clocks with different frequency and different time delays. Um, so this is how you can create all these different clocks mm -hmm. using a timing logic. So still remember how can we do that? If you have one original clock, you have one clock here. How to divide it? How to make it slower? Counter, remember? So just count for two rising edges, like this. Is it slower? We have done a lot of counters in logic. Probably still have the circuit over there in your in your some of the folders, right? So definitely check it out and see if you can do that. So I think what they did over here is nothing but just different types of counters and with conventional logic. Uh, definitely allocate some time to do this because I haven't done it yet. So this is something you need to do, figure out. And explain that to me probably in the report because I'm not planning on letting you guys do a presentation just a report okay that's the entire top view of the ADC circuit you can see it has a timing logic has SAR has DAC has comparator stamp and hold buffers so the buffers are nothing but just some uh, inverters I just make the inverters wider so you can source a lot of current from the VDD because it's being used as a buffer so you are not supposed to invert the signal so just put two inverters in series you're getting a buffer right since it's inverting and then inverting back again so it's not inverting anything but you definitely get a wider trace to be shorted to the VDD whenever it's trying to source current from the VDD. So you have a um, way better driving capability by using buffers. Remember we did that in the lab. So we designed huge inverters compared to tiny inverters. And the huge inverters can have a, can drive larger capacitors, have a, a smaller or shorter time delay. So in one of the labs, I think last lab, I guess. Yeah, 150. What do we mean by 150? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, uh, the multiplier, right? The M equals to 5, that one, I think. This is how we did it. All right. Any questions regarding the project? No. Hmm? 355. Uh, no, 350 micron. Uh, nano, nano. You mean the technologies they used? Yeah. Yeah. 350. 350 nanometer from TSMC.
Any other questions? Yes. So the goal for this class is really clear. Do not get stressful for these works, right? So uh, we need to complete this course project and we are going to cover some memory circuits and I'll give you some time to work on the project. And for the lab, I deleted the last one because I don't think you guys can complete both the course project and all this ALU at the same time for, for the rest of the semester. And do want you guys to focus more on the course project. So I'm gonna see how, how that works. So after the lab you did on Tuesday, if you did it, there will be only one lab left, which is lab nine, which will take take you probably even longer time to get this done because you can see this is really tedious. To connect all these traces. So the strategy over here is whenever you have the, you know, originally not overall, because you can see I have a vertical metal tool traces here and horizontal metal two traces, but they are pretty far away from each other, so that doesn't matter. But originally, you definitely do not want to have both vertical and horizontal metal, the same metal layer at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if I only, for example, for, for this small area, right, for this region, I want to make all these metal tool traces horizontal, so I am able to run uh, metal three vertically because they're not intersecting with each, with each other. So keep all the trees, keep all keep the same metal layer at the same direction for the small region. It doesn't matter here because it's pretty far away. So you can imagine if you have both horizontal and vertical, and sometimes sometimes you want to run. No, you can you, you just couldn't have you just cannot do it because you can see you have horizontal ones. How can I run vertical metal two traces at anywhere? You just cannot do it. Only here at the at the very end you can probably run. So one was trying to since I cannot uh, see if I have other op options here. It's not it's not necessary to for for these traces. But one was doing trying to have any vertical. Uh, metal tool in this region, I, I was trying to make it really short. Because if it's long, it's going to intersecting with these metal tools. Um, and you can imagine if, not if, you just couldn't do it. How can you have all vertical and horizontal metal tool in the same region? You have to jump it to metal three and then come back to metal tool. You know what I mean? You are still able to do that, but whenever you that metal tool, when you are running that metal tool, you vertically, and you see a metal tool in front of it, horizontal, running horizontally. You have to dig a hole to the metal three, and then come back, and then run, run metal two again. So you are going to have a lot of small pieces of metal threes, and the metal tools just everywhere, vertically and horizontally, everywhere. If you have metal threes like that, then whenever you want to connect all these guys, just using metal three, really long trees, and in during that trip in the middle right so you will see a lot of metal three metal tools everywhere and you cannot even make a straight connection just using metal three since there are so many little tiny pieces of metal threes trying to make the bridges that's a good trick here that's that's uh make sure you follow this otherwise it's going to be a lot of pain hopefully you can realize this before you start working on that all right, hopefully this will not take more than two weeks, so have time to work on the project. All right, any other questions? Do we have a, do we have a class in person next Wednesday? No, because all the class, classes are canceled, college-wide. Do we have an in-person class on Friday? No, because you are supposed to, so there will be a voltage, uh, there will be a video posted to the, the website probably, and you are supposed to work on the uh, D3 flop.
So take that chance to do that. Okay. So after Monday next week, do we have a quiz on Monday next week? Yes. C5 layers. Okay. Quiz six on Monday. Do we have a lab on Tuesday? Yes, it's a two-week lab from yesterday. And still, you, do have, you, you don't have to come over to the lab, but I will be there physically if you have any questions. Is that clear for next week? Okay, great. Which, which file? Comparator? Comparator is here? Uh, C5, I think you have C5. The 50 nanometer is in the C CMOS EDU. It's, we, it's just below that one micron technology. You don't have to use another model file. It's already in there. So uh, make sure that model file is in the designed files folder and uh, just rename the CMOS and NMOS to 50 underscore N instead of one underscore U. Great. Here's Abel's paper. Uh, it's not, since we, the college didn't buy the IEEE's library, so I found this paper from Gray, so the professors, UC Berkeley, from uh, from his uh, research gate. I don't know if he has retired or not, probably already retired. I don't know. Paul Gray, UC Berkeley. 20,000 citations. Okay, you can find out this paper over there. Um, so the, simula the overall simulation eventually should be very similar to the one we did in one of the labs. We, you know, you, after you are done with the ADC, you want to connect it to an R2R ladder and um, see if you can recover it. Because if you probe every single digital signal and you, are, you, you will have to um, open up eight window, different windows in our device to show these DC voltages. Since we have a R2R DAC, so you can use superposition. So the R2R DAC, DAC is going to do superposition for all these digital signals and keep, provide a analog signal to the output. So you can directly show a continuous, it's probably a, sig a discrete signal at the output. So this is the final simulation file to verify the functionality of the ADC, okay? And um, in LT spice, not in VLS, electric VLSI, okay? Keep in mind, since you are not laying out this design, it's just simulation. So one more thing I want to let you know, by looking at so it seems like we don't have time to run anything else. Let's just look at the circuit one more time. So this is one thing I want to show you. Um, because these guys... Hi. ...as well as the column wise. I think these guys run music through the ADC and that worked. Project and Where's the illustration? Uh, it works. So um, what I'm saying, what, what you guys think about it is the IC design over here is not is just uh, ADC. I think I mentioned about the way to convert that digital signal into an analog signal because it's playing music. You know, it's trying to drive that. Uh, I think it's a piezo electric in the speaker. So how that works? I mean, if because the output of the ADC is a digital signal output, it's a parallel digital line with eight bits. Right? How how can they play a music? Yeah, just have an R2R ladder. See the PCB. Let's take a look at the PCB. This from Moses. 
see it's not what's on the PCB. <laughs> Artois. And definitely amplify it after that because the DAC is outputting an analog signal. So the question is why do not just use the R2R letters output in the ADC? So you have R2R ADC, DAC. Why not just directly connect these eight bits? Or no, no, just directly connect this pin and use that pin to drive that speaker. Mm -hmm. You can connect the drivers to it or buffers to it. Mm -hmm. You can connect the, that pin to minus three. Think about it.